Vice President and Nelson and David Rockefeller Senior Fellow for Latin America Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, and I am a big fan of North America in many ways, as are all of the panelists that we're gonna be um, speaking today and speaking about the North America Forum, which they just wrapped up uh, just a couple of days ago in Monterey. Uh, I am not gonna go through long introductions. You can find everybody's bios uh, in the Whova app if you're more interested and, and the like. Um, but here to my left, immediate left, is Goldie Hyder. He's the president and CEO of the Business Council of Canada, and he's one of the co-chairs of the North America Forum. Uh, next to him is Richard Kai. He is the president and CEO of the Institute of the Americas in La Jolla, California. And then on the farthest left is Jaime Zabludowski. Uh, he is the executive vice president of, how do you pronounce it? I Ecom. Ecom, thank you. I mean, he's also a co-chair, a recent co-chair, as he was just telling me, of the North America Forum. Um, so we're, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions up here to get us started, but then this is really about your questions and your comments and the like. And so you can submit questions through the Whova app, um, if that, um, which is great, and do it as soon as you want, um, and then we'll start reading them. Uh, I'm also a fan of old school raise your hand, and we will also <laughs> can do it that way if people so, so choose. Um, so, to get us started, uh, and because this is about the North America Forum, I thought we could start just talking a little bit about the history of this organization, this project, sort of where it came from. So, um, I'm going to turn to Jaime, if I can, and tell us, you know, what is the North American Forum and why, why does it keep meeting? How long has it been meeting and why does it keep meeting? Yes. Well, thanks to Shannon. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And I'm honored that we have, as in, in our audience, uh, Ambassador Carla Hills. Carla Hills, as you already heard, was instrumental in the NAFTA. She is a very close friend of Mexico and of all of us. And gracias, Carla, for, for being here. Well, the, the North American Forum started in 2005, after September 11, when some people were very concerned that the attacks on the Twin Towers were going to result in the shutdown of U.S. borders. So, uh, so late Secretary of State George Schultz, the former Secretary of Finance of Mexico Pedro Aspe, and former uh, Alberta uh, Premier Peter Lockheed decided that it would be a good idea to have a mechanism, to have a venue, to have a place where people concerned about North America could get together to maintain channels of communication, to discuss, to, discuss, uh, to engage in initiatives that would allow borders to, man to, to maintain open, and most importantly, to keep building on Robert Pastor's uh, concept of the North American community. Secretary Schultz used to say very wisely that foreign policy starts in the neighborhood. And if you have a nice neighborhood, you can move around, you can go out, and you can get new friends. If your neighborhood does not work, then you cannot go out, and the only concern is security. So in 2005, uh, Schultz, Asper, and Lohit put in place this group. This group had been meeting every year, alternating countries, the US, Canada, and Mexico. And uh, Carla was part of the North America, is still part, hopefully still part of the North American Forum. And the North American Forum was instrumental in many things. Besides maintaining uh, open channels, for example, we were instrumental in getting Mexico into the TPP in 2010. There was a meeting in Washington where Carla was discussing the Doha round with Agustin Carsten. At that time, the only really trade initiative that was moving on was TPP. Agustin Carsten asked, what's TPP? We explained to Agustin what was TPP, and then some months later, President Calderon decided to make Mexico uh, join, joining TPP. So the forum was very instrumental until the pandemic. During the pandemic, we had to cancel the, the meetings. And then obviously, 
eh, Peter Lowheat Low, Low passed uh, away, Secretary Schultz passed away, and then we had uh, Tom D'Aquino as our, uh, you already saw Tom presentation today, he was the Canadian co-chair until last year when Goldie Heyer to, took the, bat, the baton and now Goldie is my counterpart. Pedro Aspe, Aspe asked me a couple of years ago to be the Mexican co-chair and in the US side after Secretary Schulz, now we have Ambassador Tom Shannon as the US co-chair of the North American Forum. So that's basically the idea. We have been meeting, we restarted the personal meetings last year at the University of California, San Diego, which leads me to an additional thing that we have now included in the new NAF. Last year, we decided that in addition to have these new co-leaders or co-chairs in the NAF, we decided to establish academic partnerships with three academic institutions, one of each country. In the US, we are honored to have the Institute of the Americas at the U University of California in San Diego. Richard is the CEO of the Institute. In Canada, we have Carlton University. And in Mexico, we establish our partnership with Universidad de Monterrey. And over Monday and Tuesday, we had our meeting in Mexico. Uh, we had uh, around between 15 or 20 people per country. And we had a very in intense agenda. We had two uh, keynote presentations, one on security and what's happening in Ukraine and Russia, and what are the implications for North America, another on the economy, uh, how the North American economy is doing, and then we have four panels. One panel on politics in the region, as Carla said, we will have elections at least in two of our countries. Goldie will tell you that we might have also Canada joining its two neighbors and have elections also, but Mexico for sure, Mexico for sure, Mexico and the US will have elections next year and that could have huge implications for North America. Then we had a panel on nearshoring, a panel on energy, and a panel on the elephant in the room, USMCA implementation and the review clause. So that was, that is what's basically the North American Forum. That is what we discussed uh, the last Monday and Tuesday. And with that, I will pass the microphone to my colleagues and we will have uh, an opportunity to go, to go back uh, to the issues that we discuss uh, at, at uh, our sessions. Thank you. Great. Let me turn to you, Richard, as the one of the anchor yeah. academic partners, and and talk a little bit about the you know the role that you're playing, but then also maybe some of your reflections on on yeah. what you heard over the course of the conference. Sure. First, um, uh, on behalf of the U.S. delegation, um, I want to. Um, um, indicate that Tom Shannon very much wanted to be here. Unfortunately, he had a um, scheduled hip um, operation, so he could not miss that appointment, but he regrets being here today. Uh, Tom Shannon um, is a board member of the Institute of the Americas, but he's also the US chair of the NAV. Tom has a special relationship with the NAV. When um, George Schultz, who um, um, retired from the State Department and moved on to the Hoover Institute, um, uh, took on the commitment for the NAF after 9-11, um, he reached out to Tom Shannon, who was someone he highly respected inside state, to be uh, his point person. And so Tom um, has a personal interest in the, in the North American agenda, and in particular in the North American Forum, because he was there at the beginning, serving as the government liaison um, with, at the, at the time, um, the Bush administration to, to shepherd the, um, the dialogue between the the North American Forum, which is a civil society organization um, with, with the governments of Canada, Mexico, and the US. So we're really honored to have Tom Shannon as our chair. Um, with respect to the, the new um, arrangement that um, Jaime spoke about, what we've realized with the North American Forum is that um, it wasn't sufficient just to meet once a year. There are 
there is a very important research agenda here. Uh, as um, Jaime alluded to, um, 2026 is going to be a very important year. That's the year of the USMCA renewal. There's a lot of misunderstanding in North America, in particular in the US Congress and in the heartland of America, about the importance of free trade. Uh, Ambassador Hill spoke about that this morning. Um, we have a lot of education to do. Unfortunately, um, on the Hill, and I have set, had spent some time working on the Hill, uh, members of Congress have very short attention spans and they focus on the crisis of the day. Right now, USMCA is not on their radar screen. It's not a priority, but it will be. And I think what we've recognized is that there's, because we, we see the issues on the horizon, it's really important to get our ducks in a row. And so one of the issues that I think we've, we've, we've recognized is that come 2026, which will be midterm elections in the United States, um, there's going to be issues, for example, of um, the um, energy. Energy is an ongoing issue that the U.S. has not been able to resolve with Mexico. Um, there are um, other issues that, that could likely emerge. Um, Canada has brought up the issue of digital trade. Um, there are um, other emerging issues that could be brought into the agreement. Our view is that we need to keep things simple. Um, right now, um, the U.S., the Biden administration does not have fast track authority. Um, to reopen the USMCA would open up a whole can of worms. As Ambassador Hill knows, she negotiated NAFTA. Uh, you pull one thread out and it all falls apart. Uh, and so I think it's really important to keep things simple. Um, one of the things that I, um, I had suggested at the, um, at the NAV meeting is that we, for some of these other ancillary issues, and some of the issues that were talked about at our meeting in Monterey, was the issue of essential medicines, pharmaceuticals, which is critical and something that's been um, growing in importance because of some of the supply shortages um, post-COVID and with the growing tensions in China. Um, so that's an issue that's out there. Food security was also an issue that was raised. But again, these are all issues that need to be addressed on the side. Um, but I think there's a lot of, um, in terms of the research front, there's a lot that needs to be done in the interim. And so that's one of the reasons why we're focusing on, the, on that area. Now, in terms of the research um, alliance, as Jaime mentioned, um, we've established a coalition um, with Carleton University in Ottawa, um, with the University of Monterey in Monterey, and the University of California, San Diego. Um, and here, I want to mention that in, in the context of UCSD, um, it's a partnership by um, the School for Global Policy and Strategy. The dean is, is Carolyn Freund and, and the Institute of the Americas, which I had. Um, the School for Global Policy and Strategy, they're focusing primarily on research and academia. The Institute of Americas, we're a convening organization. We also do research. Um, but um, together, we feel like we can better support the, um, the US uh, coordination of, of the NAV. I also want to highlight the fact that we don't believe we have a monopoly on ideas related to North America. We view our academic institutions, our respective countries, more as organizations that will coordinate other academic experts on subjects so that we can bring best of class um, thinking on emerging issues um, in our region. There's a lot that we need to um, look at in the coming, um, in the coming years in, in preparation for um, the growing debate, which will definitely come in 2026. So. Great, Goldie, let me turn to you um, and your takeaways, but from a business perspective, you know, what do you see coming out of this forum and the discussions you had? You know, this morning we started with acknowledging uh, our trailblazers, one of whom is my predecessor, and Tom DeKino, another whom I'm humbled with her presence, uh, Carla Hills here. And it made you yearn for a bygone era because it made me wonder who are today's trailblazers? Where are they going to come from? Especially when our politics universally, in many cases in democracies, has become about followership, not leadership. And so a lot of what happened at NAF was designed to, to acknowledge the role that we all need to play, whether you're in academia, whether you're in business, uh, whether you're in, uh, in advocacy in some other form. How are we going to fill that void? What is it that we need to do? Because we can sit here and complain all we like about our politics, but we're not going to get anywhere as a result of it. And our politics is, to, is designed to take people away from each other, to tear us apart. And we're looking for a way to bring people together. And you have to have common cause uh, when you do that. You have to unify around something. In 1988, it was about the idea of a, of a North America, an integrated North America, an economy that could, could compete. Uh, unfortunately, if you look at its history, though, 
the relationship has really broken down into two bilateral relationships, one of the United States and, and uh, Mexico, and another of the United States and Canada. And that means it's, it's unfulfilled potential. We, we have so much more work to do to strengthen this continent. And it starts with recognizing as business leaders, as, as uh, governors and others, that you don't get to see the world the way you want to see it. You have to see the world the way it is. <laughs> And the way the world is, and giving a shout out to Shannon and her book, is it's, it's not globalization as much as it has become regionalization. You know, during COVID, the largest trade agreement ever signed was, was, was done called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Roughly 30% of global trade, roughly 30, or global GDP, and roughly 30% of global population. Um, it includes a communist country like China and a Western democracy like Australia. And so that's about the neighborhood. Uh, we know what's happening in Europe. Many people thought Europe couldn't hold. And look at how strong Europe is. Unfortunately, I think the war really has locked Europe in. Uh, Africa has a continental free trade agreement. But for some reason, North America has very much continued to operate under a me, myself, and I kind of approach. And I think this is a defining moment for us, that if we don't seize this moment to actually realize the full potential of the vision of people like Carla and others, of what the possibilities and the potential of North America is at a time in which it plays to our strengths. So businesses are looking at this and saying, we're also partly responsible for everything I've just said. This is a collective uh, place that we've arrived at. We also just went south, wherever, we, in our case, south, right, to the United States. And we just uh, took advantage of all the opportunities that you have when you live next to the G1 when geography has blessed you in, with, with the opportunity and, and the spoils of that. But it's created a complacency and a comfort. And when we see what's going on in America, and when we realize that you know, our trade with Mexico is like 26 billion, but almost a trillion with the United States, you think, well, what, how is that possible? How is it that we haven't done more to strengthen the neighborhood? So job one is to, is to acknowledge some of the gaps that still exist, treat them with, 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 with facts, and say, what are we gonna do about it? Because if you don't strengthen, if we don't strengthen North America, North America cannot compete with the rest of the world. The rest of the world is not waiting for us to figure it out. It is moving on and it is charging ahead. So there has to be a narrative constructed, to quote uh, to Carla, we need a microphone. We need a microphone that allows us to speak to the promise of North America, the potential of North America, and that we stop thinking about the irritants, this, what I call small ball. You know, we have to start thinking bigger as a continent. And, and that requires making sure that we are functioning as well as we can uh, in our institutions. Which brings me to, I think, uh, what, what, uh, what uh, Jaime referenced is really the elephant in the room here is, there should be anxiety about the fact that we're about to go through another exercise of renewing the USMCA. I mean, it feels like the movie just ended, the horror movie, and then we all survived somehow. But Jason lived, and there's going to be a part two here, <laughs> and we're going to go at it again. And, and whatever those scenarios are, we're going to need to prepare. Uh, because again, there could be a lot of own goals. We could harm ourselves by creating uncertainty, unpredictability, and as people in this room know, uh, capital is really you know, neutral on ideology. Uh, it is neutral on nationality. Uh, it has a single anthem. Where do I go to make one dollar two? And even if you have a love for your country, you, you, and, but your country can't allow you to do that, you end up moving it. And there's a lot of money that's moving. And that's one of the things that keeps me up at night is how much of it is finding its way outside uh, of North America. So we have work to do. Uh, we in business uh, are doing our part, uh, not only with the North American Forum and the NCF and others, but I can tell you there are a number of initiatives underway at the most senior levels of, of, of businesses in our three respective countries. There are a variety of groups of CEOs only meeting with the Business Roundtable, Consejo Mexico and others, talking about the energy advantage, talking about the food security, uh, and, and, and looking at sort of playing to our strengths of manufacturing and so forth. You're gonna get a lot more ideas from the business community, but here's our main ask, do no harm. <laughs> do no harm, as, uh, as I discussed earlier just, uh, with, with Carla. Like we're in a place where if we're not careful, we could really unravel whatever gains we have made and not have a chance to, uh, chance to, to build on them. And in business, we like to start with what's the objective. And we wanna make sure that we have a clarity of what we're trying to do. And if I can say with respect to my colleagues here, coming away from NAF, 
what it showed me is there's actually a lack of clarity of what the objective is. And that's okay, at least we know that. At least we know that, that sort of where you sit, uh, and it depends on where you were standing. And, but we've got to figure out how it is we're going to come together to define that clear purpose. Are we trying to simply just tell our governors, look, we just did this deal a few years ago. Can we just let it be? Everybody agree that we're going to renew it and move right along. Because if we don't, we have two risks. One is you pull on a thread that says, I just want to change one thing. And the one thing becomes 20 things by the time you're done. Okay? And then the second piece of this is if you fail to do that, we're actually going to revert to an annual trade agreement. Like, what? <laughs> There's no conditions in which any businesses will invest capital in the society of annual trade agreements. So what are we trying to do? We have to figure that out and then develop a plan to do it. Great, thank you. Um, please, we do want your questions and participation. So if people have questions, put them in the Whova app or, or raise your hand and let me know. Um, let me just drill down and then I'm gonna come to you, Peter, next. I wanna just drill down on this because this is sort of the big immediate question. And 2026 is not that far away, especially with mm -hmm. two, perhaps three countries having mm -hmm. elections. It means a whole year is gone, basically, mm -hmm. in thinking hard about these things, at least at a political level. So, you know, the NAFTA and then USMCA are really the most formal of the undergirdings of the North American relationships. There's lots of other parts to the relationship, as we all know, but this is really the most formal. And one of the onlys that, that is trilateral in that sense, right? The security um, cooperation agreements are pretty much bilateral. Um, other agreements are pretty much bilateral. This is the one that's trilateral. So what really are, and you've, you've all kind of touched on it, but I would love to hear you each talk about this. What are the real vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. right? What is it that, um, why we don't think, why we're also worried about 2026? What are the real vulnerabilities? Is it, is it politics writ large, that you know, there's no Speaker of the House in the United States, something like that? Is it particular interest groups that are or are not participating? What is it that's the vulnerability? And then what are, as you look forward, what are the parts of USMCA um, that look most vulnerable or look most contentious thinking about a renewal? So um, who wants well, to, I'll, well, maybe I'll, I'll let start Richard start the, and then Jaime, you're next. The US is sort of the big gorilla in the room um, with the upcoming election in 2024 and, and midterms in 2026. I think. Um, in the context of uh, USMCA, I think one of the things that really worries um, uh, stakeholders in all three countries is um, we don't know what's going to happen in the in the next presidential election. We have two pres we have two front runner candidates, President Biden and um, Trump, who both are protectionists. Uh, and while Trump did sign the USMCA. Um, there's very, quite likely he's going to want to renegotiate that agreement. And, and, if that, and given some of the um, issues that have been raised by the Republicans um, on issues related to um, migration and potentially even sending um, Navy SEALs down to Mexico, um, we could end up with a very contentious situation um, when we look at um, uh, the renewal in 2026. Now, in the case of um, um, the Democrats and, and President Biden, if he does get reelected, we had a recent, you know, we've had the strikes, the UAW strikes. Um, right now, um, labor unions are starting to get their stride. And there's going to be more pressure on trying to um, drill down on rules of origin issues related to NAFTA. One of the things also that um, I think was raised during our meeting uh, at the NAV was the growing number of Chinese companies that are trying to backdoor it into the United States, setting up operations in Mexico, a lot in Nuevo Leon where we met. So um, these, are, these, are, these are areas that are concerning us because as um, Jaime and Goldie both said, uh, the risk of um, reopening the USMCA would be disastrous. And under um, section, uh, chapter 34 of the agreement, um, as Goldie alluded to, um, if um, we do not agree to um, extend it, um, then we go through a annual review of whether we want to continue or not. And it's just, as, as Jaime indicated, it's just impossible to, um, to get um, companies to invest in North America when other regions of the world are, um, are accelerating their, um, their moves um, in this era of nearshoring. Um, and you know, I think also, and this was highlighted last night, um, by uh, Chris Miller, uh, the, the threats with China are very real. 
And companies need to make decisions now. So we need to provide certainty. So this, um, the political environment doesn't um, lend itself to um, us feeling all that um, things are gonna go hunky-dory. Um, we need to be very mindful. Like Ambassador Hill this morning spoke about the importance of reaching out to local chambers of commerce, rotary clubs, um, and, um, and other key stakeholders throughout the country. This is something that was done during the NAFTA. Also, it's worth mentioning that during the NAFTA, President Clinton had a NAFTA czar, Bill Daly. He went around the country. He spoke to the chambers of commerce. He spoke to the rotaries. He spoke to mayors and governors. We need to do the same in all three countries, I would, I would mention, because um, we don't, I think, have a common vision of the importance of um, the... Of, the USMCA, and, and, and the critical importance of us working closer together in this time of global uncertainty. Well, in addition to what the Richard just mentioned, which I completely agree with, I would add the second elephant in the room, which is USMCA implementation and enforcement. One of the issues that we have seen in these first three years of the agreement is that this is a high maintenance agreement, very different from NAFTA, which was in automatic pilot, and it was a very well done agreement. It, we, we had very few controversies and very few, very few, very few violations. One, two or the three of the things that were most debated during the renegotiation was, first one, the dispute settlement provisions, in order to have a rules that would allow us to re really establish panels when panels were needed. And that's one issue that Mexico fought for and we were able to achieve it. Now, the other two th issues or the, the other two subjects that were very controversial were the auto rule of origin and energy. And precisely on those two sectors, we're having huge violations that are putting to test the other part of the agreement, which is the dispute settlement procedures. So what we're seeing today is that all of the three countries are violating the agreement, that the countries are not using effectively the dispute settlement provision, and I could use the example of the rule of, of, rule of origin panel, where the panel found that the US was violating the agreement, and Mexico and Canada has not taken the U.S. Uh, to the panel decisions so that the panel decision has, uh, would be implemented. And then we have the Mexican violations on energy and presumably in agriculture for corn chemicals. So the problem is that if we do not solve this before 2026, when the review clause is addressed, is going to be addressed, the environment is going to be very toxic. Because then there would be many people who say, why do I want to renew an agreement that is not going to be, that is not being um, uh, respected? So in addition to the problem of the review clause itself, is the attitude of the three governments. There's also the daily problem between the US and Canada. And as Richard said, the three governments, in particular Mexico's government and the U.S. government, pay a lot of lip service to the agreement, but they don't respect either, either the, rule, the, the, the spirit or the letter of the agreement. So I think that's very important. One thing that we have to do is to be sure that the two new administrations in the U.S., and Mexico, whoever is uh, re-elected in the U.S. or elected in the U.S. and in Mexico, realize that if they don't get their act together in terms of implementing the agreement, 2026 is going to be more difficult than already is. So that's the only silver bullet on the agreement today is the labor chapter, which has been working, quote unquote, very nicely because the Mexican labor legislation is very being applied and is being contested when it's not being applied right. And this gives us some sort of relief because Democrats would never want to lose the rapid response mechanism. So that thing, I think, is a silver wood that might make the renew clause 
a little bit easier. Well, do you want to add anything yeah. or should we go to questions? Um, I'll quickly just add, yeah. uh, Jaime mentioned uh, enforcement as, as, uh, as concern. I'm going to add three quickies. One is elections, which Richard uh, has already talked about. But I, I think we, should, we know it's either this or that. It's not complicated. No. We just have to prepare for this or we have yes. to prepare for that. Well, so let's be prepared is, is the second message. <laughs> the risk here I see that's, that's bigger is the economic risks. Uh, I know we have economists to make weathermen look good, but eventually they're going to be right about a recession. <laughs> And the possibility of it coming sometime next year in advance of the U.S. election uh, is growing. And maybe there's a soft landing, but a lot of people are feeling pain. This may not be a, a recession across the board, but a number of segments of society run the risk of feeling pain. And they're going to be stoked that trade is the cause of that pain. It's always the same three issues, right? And these, on the right side is either abortion, it's immigration, or it's trade. But from an economic perspective, if they say trade is the reason and the, ar the architect of the USMCA turns against his own agreement because it was poorly implemented by the other side, mm -hmm. we've opened up a whole new can of worms here. And so I think we have to be very cognizant of the impact of a potential economic slowdown and how trade could become the scapegoat of that. And we have to prepare for that and prevent that from being the case. Mm -hmm. um, Peter, I know you had a question. So in line, very much in line with the comments that are being made then, um, I would go a little further and say, we haven't just reached a point where there's either a leadership void or where there's a ph philosophical void. I think it's been around for a while. And that makes this a greater challenge because how do you, how do you persuade, when it was hard to persuade that regional trade was a good thing to do in the first place. And, and Carla mentioned that in her comments this morning. You know, we in Canada had a government that almost fell as a result of that. So this is tough stuff to do. And it's counterintuitive actually to take international trade theory and to get the general public to say gains from trade actually do work. It's, it doesn't make sense to the average person. It's hard to do in the first place. Now we're dealing with scorched earth because it seems to have failed. The verdict on it in 2008 was it almost blew the system up. Whether that was right or not, that was the general impression that folks had. So if it was hard in the first place, and we're now dealing with sort of scorched earth that this doesn't work, that this almost blew the system up, I think our challenge on the philosophical front is that much more difficult at this point. I would just submit that. And that, you know, as Goldie has said, Leaders have turned into a, a followership now, and they're just, they're just doing what the public is telling them to do. So if their perception is that this has failed, they're going to pander to that. So the difficulty is, how do, how do you turn that kind of a ship around? And I think you know, that's, that's, that's the forum's job. That's our collective job to actually do that. But I think we're short of answers on that. One thing I may submit, sorry to prolong this, is opportunity was used as the first sales pitch, and that was a tough one to do. I wonder if the sales pitch now is the risk of not doing it, mm -hmm. turning the argument around. So I just throw that out as a possibility, not to feed an answer, but really, you know, that's, this is an inquisitive, you know, moment, and, and I'm very inquisitive about this as well. So I'm not directing this to anybody in particular. I think this is something we could probably spend the rest of the time talking about. Thank you. But if I could just jump in on, on this, I, it gets back to education. Uh, I think that there's a lack of understanding by the, in mainstream America, about um, the, the importance of trade for many of their jobs. Um, I remember when I was working on the NAFTA, um, we, we, um, we took a delegation of members of Congress down to Mexico. We went into a Walmart. And we, we brought 22 mem undecided members of Congress, and they could, and we, and Walmart had labeled all of the products, but the the origin of those product of those products and the number of jobs that were at stake, and I think that that helped a lot of members of Congress better understand the interdependency. The reality is that um, our um, our current. Um, Trade relationships are integral to all three countries, and but I think there's a lot of there's a lack of knowledge of, about 
why that matters. And I think that's the job we have going ahead. And if I may, I think that we have also to, to make the security argument as well. Because with all these concerns that we have been looking at, at this, seeing at this in the IRA legislation and the chip legislation and the trade war against China that both President Trump and President Biden have been carrying for the last five to six years, I think that only to the extent that the U.S. can rely on Mexico and Canada for the productive change, they would be able to keep working and keep producing. So at some point in time, at some point in time, I think that we have to make, not we, but perhaps the U.S. and the U.S. the U.S. stakeholders make the security argument about the importance of North America. The problem is that we have other issues that are contaminating or are permeating in, in the bilateral agenda, obviously, uh, drug trafficking, uh, armed trafficking, migration. Uh, but we have to make the argument that in spite of these issues, uh, contaminating the trade relation not only wouldn't help, but would make things worse. I would say uh, very quickly, um, pre prepare. Right? Number one job is to prepare, uh, prevent, Let's not open this whole thing up. Make the case. It's very early days. We're in the first time it's been renewed. We don't need to open it all up. We just did this a little while ago. The last time we did this, it took 20 years before we opened it up. There's no urgency. Create some side processes, some side agreements that we can start talking about and punt to a more rational time one hopes that awaits us um, uh, in the future someday. Secondly, we're living in an era of alternate facts. But we have on our side the facts, and we have to make sure they're better known. All of us have a responsibility. Canada is the number one customer of 33 U.S. states. I don't know how many, and we have to do a better job of reminding them of that, but your own governors and your own straight officials have to remember that your customer is king. And so if you destroy this trade agreement, you're going to expose yourself to losing uh, your customers. And then thirdly, and this is what we're doing in Canada, and Anne McClellan, who's here, was a co-chair last year here, and uh, another colleague, Lisa Raitt, are chairing. Um, it's, it's a sense of, of, of how do we bring civil society together? And here I would emphasize the United States in particular, but it's not unique. Every one of our governments and all our opposition parties are now workers' parties. There's nowhere you can find a, a, somebody would say, I'm a business party, I support business. Okay? I, I always say, where do the workers work? But, but nevertheless, they're all workers' parties. So we have to bring the unions on board. They were very helpful to us in the renewal of the USMCA last time, and we need to make sure that they can help articulate a case that might be better heard by our elected officials than it will be coming from business. I just wanted to jump back to this question on security that Jaime raised, because I think it's, it's really important. I think um, it's really important that members of Congress really understand how, how critical it is in, in the context of not just USMCA, but the overall relation, the trilateral relationship. Chris um, Miller yesterday spoke about the emerging threats in China um, and the risk of, of potentially a blockade uh, in Taiwan that could be highly disrupted to um, our eco the global economy. Um, and God forbid we have a war that, um, that breaks out. But if that were to happen, we would be highly vulnerable. We do need to shore up our supply lines. And this is why the whole issue of nearshoring is critically important. And while, yes, we do have some security issues with, with Mexico, we have issues of migration, we, we have challenges with uh, transnational um, organized crime, the more we lean in and create jobs and opportunity, we create um, prosperity. And with that prosperity brings more hope in Mexico. And I think that's where we need to focus. Um, because if we don't, we, if, we, if we become more protectionist, um, we close our borders, we can look to um, a more bleak future uh, and, a, and, a, and a more toxic binational relationship, which is going to make um, life more difficult for all Americans. So I think that Americans need to be pragmatic and see that um, USCMCA and this nearshoring opportunity is critically important to America's national security interests. When we talk about nearshoring, I'm well aware that most of the arguments narrow down to national security, uh, supply chain resiliency, and, and so many others. 
But one important factor from my perspective are market dynamics in the sense that consumers are now looking for getting their products right away. I want to go to Amazon and I want to receive something in, ter in terms of hours, right? If it's two days ahead, it's no longer useful. And that has a lot to be uh, also with young people uh, becoming even more uh, important in, in terms of market share, right? And uh, there is a generational change. I am a millennial, almost whatever comes next, centennial or Gen Z, I don't know. Um, and I do see in the position I'm in a wider gap in the way, um, I don't mean to say, well, you guys, uh, and, and many of the people in charge, and myself and my generation. So I know you mentioned this during the panel, but I would like to dig deeper into your brains on how can we make that generational uh, transition which doesn't mean getting rid of, of old leadership. <laughs> I'm using the wrong words all along. Um, more experienced leadership and new leadership, right? It, it's a matter of transitioning and, and incorporating new voices. What, what's your take on that? Well, my short and sorry if I was politically incorrect all along my, my intervention, no. I'm sorry. My short answer is that it's your turn. This is your problem. No, but really. <laughs> No, I think that one of the things that we're trying now to do at the North American Forum is precisely that. One of the reasons why we brought along the academic partnership is precisely to be able to bridge the gap between the generation or the people that were involved, not only in NAFTA, but in the whole process of integrating the three economies with the younger generation. I think that one, one of the problems that we have and that you have is that you take this for granted and that most of you were not born when we had a different economy, when, you, when we did not have Walmart, when, you, when, you, when we did not have not only just in time, but now just in case, mm -hmm. because of this redundancy in the productive chains. So I think that the people that do not know how Mexico was before Carla came to Mexico and invited us to open up our economy, uh, we have to really make an exercise and imagine how Mexico would uh, be if we lose not only the USMCA, but the whole integration process. And obviously we have the responsibility to try to educate and to try to close the gap. But I think that you also have to be part of the process. Yeah, I was, and I, was I think that Amcham <laughs> could be instrumental in doing this. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to work together with American companies that are in Mexico and to help us remind the rest of the people how the world would look if we don't have the things that we have today. I was going to say the exact same thing as a father of three daughters in that category of 28, 26, and 22 is, um, yeah, we've made a mess of the world. It's on us. We're the first generation ever to leave behind a much more difficult situation for the next generation, but it's not too late. There's still things we can do about it, but young people have to speak up about something they don't speak up of enough. I'm a believer, very strong believer, that so many of the issues that we're dealing with today, they're not the same issues if we could bring about economic growth. If we have a growing economy and you have prosperity and you have people with jobs and you have people planning a vacation, happy people tend not to be protesters. They tend not to be suckered by those who want to create divisions and fear because they're happy. What's missing is growth. We have no growth in our economies. In Canada, the sole source of growth is immigration. That, that's all. So if we could have more young people say, I actually want an economy that's working for me now and in the future. And all of you spend so much of your time on very important social issues or big issues like the climate, whether it's indigenous reconciliation, whether it's gender equality, any of these issues are critically important issues. But you and we risk not paying attention to those issues in an environment in which the economy is not growing. These are not either or questions, it's and. So if young people said, the next time somebody tries to say, oh, I'm doing all these social, what are you doing to create jobs? What are you doing to grow the economy? What are you doing to make North America competitive? When young people start asking those questions, then those other leaders may change and say, what's going on over here? And this is what I mean by the civil society needs to come together to create hope that's lacking in our politics and make them follow. And all it means to make them follow is build a bigger parade than everybody else. 
That's all. Build a parade that says, I want economic growth and have more people on that side of the ledger than on the other side of the ledger saying, I want some other thing. If you do that, I think we have a much better society in which to live. I wanted to follow up on your question and bring it back to the North American Forum. So um, one of the things that uh, we made a commitment to with, this, with the North American Forum 2.0 was a commitment not only to one working, um, instead of a hub and spoke arrangement, which was the original arra uh, arrangement on, you know, when George Schultz was running it, but to make it more equal partners. But the other thing we've done is a commitment to um, share knowledge with the next generation um, and to be begin uh, trying to cultivate those emerging leaders. Yeah. Um, uh, in our, in our uh, meeting last year in La Jolla at UC San Diego, we had a session with students um, where we have the three chairs um, sh you know, provide sort of highlights of the meeting. We did the same thing two days ago in Monterey. We had over 60 students, undergrads, grad students from the University of Monterey, um, and um, we had an opportunity to share uh, and reflect on some of the highlights of the meeting and some of the emerging issues and why students need to lean in and commit themselves to this North America future. I also want to mention this is something we're still in the planning phases of, but was discussed at our meeting um, in Monterey, was the idea of, of, of creating an initiative for emerging leaders. And here we're looking at 20s, 30s, 40s, um, in, in, in the next generation, um, new CEOs of, of companies in, their, in our three countries, um, mayors, um, um, senior officials, um, emerging civil society leaders, uh, so that we could help pass the baton. All of us um, sitting up here were part of the NAFTA generation, but we, we now have recognized that we need to help inspire the next generation because this is going to be a 20, 30 year effort. Uh, it, it's not going to be easy. So the more that we can um, inspire individuals like you and others that are here at this conference, to, um, to commit to this agenda um, for your professional careers, uh, I think we'll have a, a bright future, but it's gonna take a lot of work. And so we're conscious of that, and that's something that we're trying to embrace with, this, um, with the North American Forum. I'm gonna take a question right there in the back, please. How can we, you know, work, we're going to have elections in Mexico, in the US. How can we work on aligning priorities among the three countries, you know, towards that, uh, in advance to that review, no? So uh, that was my, that is my question, thank you. Maybe just a, everyone to jump, just a short answer to that, but here, you know, this is not about, the politics are complicated and they're not gonna do it, so maybe talk a bit about civil society, academia, or business, what it is, you know, just a few words perhaps to add to what we've been discussing. Well, I, I, as, as I said, I think that the, the most important thing is to get to 2026 with the agreement working well, because otherwise we are going to have a very toxic environment. And the people and the sector and the stakeholders that are not getting from the USMCA what they were expecting from the agreement are going to be very vocal. And they are going to be asking, I want to be sure that the energy sector is applied and I want to be sure that this is applied. So that's something that we have to take care of that. Secondly, I do think that we could have a, an environment where the agreement is renewed quickly, but that would depend very much on US elections, right? basically. Because I do think that if President Trump is re-elected or comes back to power, even though he might be very proud of, about his agreement, he might take the agreement hostage to other issues. Mm -hmm. And he would say, as much as the agreement is ideal and I was able to fix this nasty NAFTA that Carla negotiated, <laughs> uh, now uh, I want this very good agreement, this ideal agreement, Mexico does not deserve this agreement as long as he, the, they don't put him in, their house in order for drugs or for migration. So I think that we have to be ready, as Goldie said, we have to imagine the worst case scenario, and we have to start mobilizing at its time. I don't, I don't think that it's a good idea at this stage or start talking about the renew clause. I think it's a very bad idea because it then becomes a piñata 
and everybody will start hitting the piñata. But we have to be ready and we have to imagine scenarios and we have to have uh, coalitions ready and be able to mobilize whenever it would be ready. So we are hitting the end of our time and I guess as I reflect on this panel, um, you know, lots of things are important. And, and what's interesting is we focus so much on USMCA, which is, you know, as we know, the formal agreement yeah. that we have to sort of undergird the North, North America. Um, but it's not the only question, right? And I do think it's interesting. We didn't get to security or the environment or energy or people or labor or some of other issues. So I do think as we go forward, um, maybe we need formal agreements that undergird those things. Maybe we don't need formal agreements. But as we think about these various issues, all of those are going to impinge on the economic growth that needs to happen, on the, you know, the support and, and sort of that you build up in Congress, because those are also things that people um, feel. So with that, um, I want to thank all the panelists um, for the work they do in the North America Forum, and then also for sharing all of this with us. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.